Nawapa 21, an updated and expanded version of the 1964 proposal, seeks to create a continental system of water regulation that can redistribute wasted runoff waters of northern Canada and Alaska to make the Great American Desert bloom. It would turn would-be floodwaters in one area into the means for fighting drought in another, all through the construction of a massive infrastructural network which can direct these flows and provide a scientific analysis of their best use. The specific design arose out of the consideration of a unified management system which incorporates the topographical, geological, and hydrological characteristics of the North American continent, harnessing the abundant northern precipitation caused by the interaction of the Pacific Ocean weather patterns and mountain topography. The easterly migration of moist air evaporated from the Pacific Ocean contributes to very heavy precipitation along the cold, higher elevations of the Alaskan and British Columbian coasts, and also extends further down to the coastal mountains of Oregon. These regions receive the major portion of their annual moisture during the winter season, while the inverse is true for interior regions. When high pressure ridges form near the west coast, even more water is diverted to Canada and Alaska, contributing to droughts in the west and underscoring the need for continental scale water management. With a virtually constant input of solar energy to drive the ocean evaporation, a constantly replenishable water source is available if we apply our creative powers to harness it. Nawapa 21 seeks to modify and redirect the awesome hydrological resources of the Pacific Ocean weather cycle through the continent's interior, extending the time the fresh water interacts with vegetation, stream and ground flow, and industrial processes before returning to the ocean. It is estimated that 40% of precipitation over continents returns directly as runoff or groundwater discharge to oceans, while the remaining 60% re-evaporates and falls back onto land, recycling itself an average of 2.7 times before returning to the ocean. In building Nawapa 21, water which was once runoff will be used not once, but multiple times as it recycles as rainfall across the continent before exiting the system. The concept of Nawapa 21 takes into account the anomalously high runoff in the north, totaling approximately 1,300 million acre-feet of water per year by conservative estimates, along with the fact of the very sparse water resources available in areas such as the southwest United States, where runoff is only about 32 million acre-feet per year. Of the total river basins in Alaska, British Columbia, and Yukon, the Nawapa 21 catchment area encompasses rivers which have an annual runoff of 630 million acre-feet per year. Of this, the Nawapa 21 collection system plans to redirect 22%, or 138 million acre-feet per year, for hydropower generation and for the distribution of water to the southwest United States and northern Mexico. The remaining 78% will flow in its normal direction. This 138 million acre feet per year of water used to upgrade the potential of these lands would thus be about 11% of the excess water which is currently flowing, practically unused, into the ocean in Alaska, British Columbia, and Yukon. The original 1964 proposal increases the total Mackenzie Basin contribution to about 20%, providing 40 million acre feet of water per year for agriculture in the prairie provinces and a barge canal from the Peace River to Lake Superior. The central principle is total water management with respect to the governing characteristics of the continent's topographical and climatological features, rather than being subject to local conditions. Total resource management is scientific management and the only choice for those who seek long-term security for the nations of the hemisphere. Reservoirs in the Alaskan and Yukon River basins, with a storage capacity of over 2 billion acre feet, are formed by six dams. A fraction of the total runoff is directed south, down the Yukon River, pump lifted 300 feet in northern British Columbia, 
and then lifted another 670 feet in southern British Columbia into a reservoir at 3,000 feet above sea level created out of the 500 miles of the Rocky Mountain Trench. The waters will then be distributed and pumped through a succession of reservoirs in Idaho and then distributed through canals, aqueducts, and tunnels to the southwest United States. In Utah, the water flow will branch in two directions. The first branch heads into southern Nevada and then branches west into California's Panamint Valley and south paralleling the Colorado River to irrigate southern California, western Arizona, and northern Mexico. The second branch flows into eastern and southeastern Utah, linking up with Lake Powell's distribution system. Part of the flow could be used to supplement the Colorado River and increase the power capacity of the Hoover Dam. Continuing into Arizona, 11 reservoirs are created, including what will become Lake Navajo, 30 miles from Flagstaff, which at over three times the size of Lake Mead, will be the largest reservoir on the United States side of the project. Canals branch throughout the state, providing water where irrigation is needed, with one branch creating five reservoirs west of Phoenix and continuing into Sonora, and the other creating three reservoirs as it enters into New Mexico. The New Mexico distribution brings substantial flows to the Picos and Rio Grande regions via three branches down into northern Mexico and Texas, and creates two major reservoirs in New Mexico, one the size of Lake Mead, before pumping water north to Colorado. In total, 32 reservoirs will be created throughout the southwest, with a total storage capacity of 233 million acre-feet of water. As currently designed, the system would deliver 52 million acre-feet per year for distribution through the southwest. Enough water to cover deficits in the Colorado and Rio Grande Basin reservoirs and delivery systems, and will add enough water to irrigate 19 million acres of land, twice the current amount. It would deliver 20 million acre-feet per year to northern Mexico, irrigating up to 5 million acres. By way of the Great Lakes Seaway Canal, 19.6 million acre-feet of water would be delivered to Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, enough water to irrigate up to 9 million acres of land or supply water for industrial and petrochemical developments in the region. The Dakota Canal would deliver 11 million acre-feet per year to North and South Dakota, irrigating approximately 3 million acres. Being built along a continental divide, the canal could serve as a water redirection system, solving the annual flooding problem in the Grand Forks, Fargo-Moorhead areas of Minnesota and North Dakota. This Great Lake Seaway system, stretching from Vancouver, British Columbia, to Lake Superior, along with a branch to the Hudson Bay, as well as a canal from James Bay to Georgian Bay, will open up a vast amount of resource potential for Canadian development and export creating an industrial and water transport corridor throughout southern Canada akin to the Mississippi River Barge Corridor. By constructing the system of storage, flood control, and water delivery, the utilization of the total topographical potential which the project intersects will produce a surplus of power over the 36 gigawatts of electrical power required for pumping within the project. Most notable will be an annual surplus of 32 gigawatts in British Columbia, a greater than 100% increase of its current power capacity. The original 1964 proposal estimates that building Nawapa would require 100,000 workers employed for 30 years and would create some 4 million jobs through direct and indirect employment. An updated estimate based on Nawapa 21 needs to be produced. It must take into account the new additions to the project that would augment water flow in certain basins, the needed rebuilding of today's decrepit basic infrastructure and manufacturing facilities, and the new technologies that were not included in the original plan, such as nuclear reactors, satellite imaging, and large diameter tunnel boring machines. No part of the original design is exempt from alteration if a new or more detailed analysis finds that a modification is either more appropriate for today's needs or more scientifically efficient. 
Updates to NOAPA 21 will include all programs which can be naturally incorporated into the continental system, following the topographical, geological, and hydrological characteristics as a whole, irrespective of local issues. Along with water regulation extensions added to the original NOAPA project, there are further important changes that will be required. For the lower 48 states, a major expansion to the current rail grid, both with respect to routes and equipment, is needed. High capacity lines, as well as a number of rail cars, will need to be manufactured before the efficient transport of construction materials and machinery requisite for NOAPA 21 can be executed. The Canadian Pacific will need additional routes to Lower British Columbia, as well as a major investment to complete the Alaskan-Canadian connection system, estimated at 2,000 miles, for two new routes. These routes can be adjusted to meet the needs of NOAPA 21. A planned Central North American trade corridor stretching from Mexico through Texas, North Dakota, and on to Alaska, linking with the proposed Bering Strait Tunnel, can similarly be adjusted to meet the needs and reap the benefits of NOAPA 21. As exemplified by the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad in the 19th century, such transportation corridors will serve as important catalysts for new city building in the underpopulated western and northern regions of the United States and Canada. The roads needed for the rail construction and the subsequently installed rail lines will create transport corridors from the states of Washington and North Dakota directly through British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Alberta to Alaska and Yukon. These corridors will not only provide efficient construction and maintenance of the NOAPA system components, but along with the barge canals planned in the original design, will open up access to new areas of northern Canada and Alaska for scientific analysis resource prospecting, mining and processing, in addition to supporting already existing mineral and energy resources in the area. This is not mere resource extraction. It will signify the long overdue development of the vast territories of Canada and Alaska. The infrastructure needed for the efficient construction of NOAPA 21 will simultaneously aid the United States and Canada in establishing a presence in what is becoming the next great frontier for human development, the Arctic. The harsh conditions associated with intensive industrial operations near the Arctic will demand great breakthroughs in engineering techniques and will serve as a springboard and testing ground for various space technologies involved in lunar industrialization, as shown by the design for the city of Umka, currently proposed for the Russian Arctic, based on the life support designs of the International Space Station. NOAPA 21, during its 20 to 30 year construction cycle, will transform and advance the physical economies of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and will be a virtual laboratory for the development of new industrial technologies, new applications of the geotechnical sciences, and new methods of large-scale biospheric engineering. The detailed plans for the construction of NOAPA 21, along with the details of how NOAPA will restore the public credit of the United States, are contained in the recently published LaRouche Pack Special Report, NOAPA 21. A PDF of the report is available online at larouchepack.com slash NOAPA 21, and physical copies are available from LaRouche Pack for the suggested contribution of $100. To order, call 1-800-929-7566. Further video material discussing the details of NOAPA 21 are also available at larouchepack.com slash NOAPA 21.